Let's talk about Afghanistan and what's happened since the U.S. pulled out and the Taliban took over. There was the desperate scramble to leave. And there were fears about what might happen to those who couldn't. And there were so many questions about what life would be like under the Taliban. We've seen protests, bombings. The economy has basically collapsed, and people are really struggling. This is a countdown to catastrophe. The Taliban have now been in power for 100 days. That's 100 days to figure out how to run a country of almost 40 million people. So if you've not been following the story, here's what's going on. Let's start with how almost everybody in Afghanistan, 95%, don't have enough food to eat. More than half the population are at risk of starvation. That's 23 million people and it includes three million children under the age of five. It's, it's the worst time of crisis ever. And when you combine that with freezing winter conditions, you've got catastrophe. Poverty, hunger, and tough winters are nothing new in Afghanistan. But right now, two things are making the food crisis so much worse. First, there's a terrible drought. And second, there's the state of the economy. The whole financial system collapsed. Uh, our, our assets were frozen. Aid money was cut. So what happened was when the Taliban took over, the U.S. froze more than $9 billion of Afghan assets. That's basically money and investments held in the U.S. At the same time, foreign financial aid was also cut, pretty much overnight. Now you have to realize that under the old government, 75% of its budget was foreign aid. And that money's just not there anymore. The economy of Afghanistan was completely artificial. It revolved around aid. And to, to see that, that on day one, the aid, the assets, the loans, everything gets cut. How are you going to survive? So the U.S. and others don't want the Taliban to get their hands on any of this money but it's crippled the economy. One of the big problems is a major shortage of cash in a country that runs on cash. The banks don't have enough and have set limits on withdrawals. And everything's getting more expensive, especially imports like fuel, because the currency, the Afghani, has dropped to an all-time low against the dollar. From civil servants to construction workers, people just aren't getting paid. <laughs> For a country that had a budget of 11 billion in 2019 and now having literally nothing, it's a humanitarian crisis and we can't be numb to the situation, no matter who's in power. Not a single country has officially recognized the Taliban government, but the Afghan people are also hurting from this isolation. The UN and other international aid agencies are still working in Afghanistan to deliver food and supplies. That's the main way help is getting to the Afghan people right now. But Afghanistan needs so much more than just emergency aid. It needs to be able to trade like any other country. Whether anyone likes it or not, the Taliban are the reality of the country right now. And if you say that you care about the people of Afghanistan, then you need to deal with the people who are the leaders now. So who are the leaders? Well, they've named an interim government made up entirely of senior Taliban members. Mohammed Hassan Akund, he's the acting prime minister and is on a UN sanctions list. Sirajuddin Haqqani, who's designated a terrorist by the US, is the interior minister. And Mohammed Yaqub, the son of the Taliban's founder, is the defense minister. There's also the Taliban's supreme leader, Hibatullah Akunzada, who has ultimate authority over the group, but he's rarely seen in public. So who's really in charge and what their plans are 
it's just not very clear. We don't know who is playing the shots. You know, nobody knows who plays the shots. They are unable to communicate what exactly they are up to and what exactly are their plans. So far it has been 100 days and what is economic policy of the Taliban? How they are addressing the poverty, unemployment. The Taliban do not have experience or funding or personnel to deliver sophisticated government services. And there's also confusion about what the new social codes are, which so many people were worried about when the Taliban came to power. The leadership have said that people's rights will be protected in accordance with Islamic law, at least their version of it. That is our vision for, for a future Afghanistan, where we are an open society, a diverse society, where, where people have freedom of movement, freedom of expression, uh, and uh, all the other rights that Islam has given to every single individual. The problem is they haven't really specified what they mean by that. All we know is what's happening on the ground, and what's happening on the ground is a mixed picture. What they're saying at the top isn't reaching the bottom. They said, dress how you want, do what you want, go about your life, we're not going to get in your way. But there have been several instances where they do actually come at you, and sometimes they're violent with it, and sometimes it's just, it's just a verbal confrontation. For certain areas, now they are cautious uh, of how to present themselves and probably in, in certain areas they have softened their attitude but that does not indicate any departure from the core fundamental principles of their ideology. In Herat, Taliban officials killed four alleged kidnappers and hung their bodies up in public. And in Kabul, two journalists were beaten when covering protests led by women. And what about the situation for women? Well, there have definitely been changes. The Women's Affairs Ministry is now the Ministry for Propagation of Virtue and Prevention of Vice. Female aid workers have been restricted from doing their jobs in more than 30 provinces. Women are mostly back at university, but they have to study separately from men. The women can continue their university studies, but access has been widely restricted. Now the confusion is, who is it restricted by? The Taliban? family members or the individuals afraid to be active in society because from my own organization, Her Afghanistan, I have samples of all three. And there are even fewer answers for teenage girls. In most provinces, they haven't been allowed to return to school. The Taliban say that's temporary, but there's skepticism. The first time when the Taliban came, they did not say that schools are going to be closed for girls. They didn't. Their excuses were exactly the same excuse as now. Wait, we will fix it for you. And the women of Afghanistan waited six years and it never got fixed. So you see, there is no trust. Okay, so what about security? Because that's something the Taliban said they can handle. That was the one thing that they kept hyping themselves up about. You know, they're like, when we come, peace will be here, P violence will end, bombings will stop. But they haven't quite been able to deliver on that because an affiliate of ISIL, a group known as ISKP, has stepped up attacks since the Taliban took over. There was a suicide bombing at Kabul's international airport that killed more than 180 people. Another attack at a military hospital killed 25. And ISKP have claimed responsibility for at least two attacks on Shia mosques, where dozens were killed. Now remember, it wasn't very long ago that the Taliban were the ones carrying out attacks. So one of the big challenges for the new government is how to navigate this kind of role reversal. On the one hand, you have to deal with this armed group that's doing all the kinds of things you used to do. And then on the other, you have to figure out how to, at the very least, try and operate better than this former corrupt government that you were fighting all along. And they haven't been able to really succeed in either metric. The Taliban, though, say it's still early days. Rome was not built in a day. What we are asking uh, is uh, for time. Thing is, right now, Afghans don't have time. Their lives are at stake. And after 100 days with the Taliban in charge, there are still so many questions about Afghanistan's future. Questions that the Taliban need to answer, but plenty of others that the US and the international community need to answer too.